Thank you very much for coming this evening. First of the three lectures on the healing of the nations, a journey through the book of Revelation. Uh, about 30, 35 uh, people have come from different parts of India, two from America, a few from Abu Dhabi, one from Singapore, uh, to spend 12 days in the beautiful beaches of Goa uh, to read the whole book of Revelation. We've just been reading the, reading the text, and the only commentaries we have used are the commentaries that would have been available to some of John's readers that were Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, uh, Zechariah, uh, etc. These, these are the commentaries uh, on Revelation in the sense that uh, John is drawing many of his imageries from these books besides the Gospel his time with Jesus. So uh, those are the only commentaries we have used, and even those we haven't used adequately because we were basically reading the text. And uh, what we are focusing on in these evenings, uh, three lectures, is the phrase from Revelation 22, verse 2, where the climax of the Bible climax of the book of Revelation is John says in Revelation 22, 1 and 2 then the angel showed me the river of the water of life bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit, fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations, that's the climax of the book of Revelation. The, the book of Revelation and God's revelation in the Bible is not about the destruction of the earthquakes and fires sun, the moon, and stars being struck, <coughs> locusts and horses and fire and chariots uh, causing havoc. But the end of it all is God's heart to bless the world that he loved. And he loved the world enough uh, to give his son for the world, for the healing of the nations, for the blessing of the world. So that's heart of the Bible, that God, soul of the world, that he gave his only begotten son, not to destroy the earth, but so that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That was the promise that God had made to Abraham. That you follow me, I will bless you. I will make you a great nation. Because through you, I want to bless all the nations of the earth, including India. So, if you follow me, you will become a great nation and India will be blessed, all the nations will be blessed and that in fact is the climax where God is uh, leading, the whole book of Revelation is leading. There are two images which come in chapter 21 and 22 that we can look at both of them today and we will dig deeper into these in the days to come. In chapter one, 21 uh, is the sort of conclusion. The millennium has happened in chapter 20. The final judgment has happened in chapter 20. Uh, Satan and the false be beast and the false prophet and all the sinners have been thrown into hell. And then there is new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem in chapter 21. In verse 9. Uh, it says of chapter 21, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues, he spoke to me. So he's been uh, pouring, uh, one of those who have been pouring the wrath of God upon the nations, upon the world. But he's saying that actually the object of all of this is not to destroy, but to heal, to bless. So he says to me, come. I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. 
and he carried me away in the spirit to a great mountain. Now keep that phrase in mind. He carried me in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare, rare jewel, uh, like a jasper, clear as crystal. <coughs> So he goes into a great description of this beautiful city uh, which he says is the bride of Christ. And then in verse 22 he says, And I saw no temple in the city. This is Revelation 21, 22. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God the Almighty. The God himself is the temple. And the Lamb. He is the temple. Actually, the city is the temple for the worship of God. And it's made of, as we will see, living stones. Each one of them is a temple. Uh, we are the temple of God. So, there is no temple in the city. And verse 23, And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives its light and its lamp is the lamp. By its light will the nations walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it and its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. So here is the image. Angel says, come, I will show you the bride. John goes to this high mountain and he sees a city, the bride of Christ. This has no temple, it has no need for sun and moon, for Lord God, the Lamb, or the light, is the light of this city, and the city radiates that light, so kings of the nations will walk in its light, and uh, <laughs> uh, they will bring their wealth, their honor, their glory, their splendor, their greatness. So there are a lot of contrasts here. Uh, but before we get into the contrast and those details, the overall point I want to make is very simple. That in the first chapter of Revelation, and if you haven't brought your Bible today, please do bring it from tomorrow. We'll be looking at hundreds of verses. In chapter 1 of Revelation, um, but we'll also be posting these online, these videos. Um, so, in, in case you'd rather just hear, that's okay. Uh, we have the vision of Jesus. A voice is speaking to John. He turns to look at the voice. And what he sees is Jesus Christ, whose face is burning as the sun at its full brightness, walking in the midst of seven golden lampstands. And in the same chapter, chapter 1, the lampstands are interpreted for us that these are the seven churches in Turkey, uh, what the cities which, is not, which are now in Turkey. So Jesus is walking amongst the golden lampstands. It's a lampstand that does not have a light. It's just a stand on which you put the lamp. Once uh, the lamp is on the lampstand, then it gives light to all those who are there. So that's the image. The church is the lampstand. Jesus is the light of the world. When he is on us, we become the light of the world. The lampstand begins to give light to the world. So, but when there are lots of lampstands, lots of bulbs shining on a city on a hill, it becomes the city of light, a city on a hill. Uh, that's the image uh, which uh, the Mayflower Covenant people, Puritans, who are going to in America, USA. Um, that time it's not USA, North America, geographic North America. They're going there. They're going to build a city on a hill which will give light to the nations. <coughs> so this is the image that is coming. Now it is. For individuals, Jesus says, I am the light of the world, 
He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. The world is walking in darkness, and that was the subject of uh, our previous session on corruption. The world is walking in darkness. But if Jesus says, if you follow me, you will not walk in darkness, but you will have the light of life. Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 5, and those are the verses that we could look at, which is inspiring John, that's uh, chapter 21. Uh, Revelation 21 is being inspired by Matthew 5, 13 to 17, 16. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. That means that you have to become a lampstand that takes the light and let Jesus sit on you. So you are, in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. And in verse 14 of Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So individually you are the light. As a church you are the lampstand. And then when there are lots of lampstands that have lamp, uh, the light uh, sitting on it, then you become a city set on a hill. And Jesus goes on to say that uh, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, lamp stand, and give light to all this house. In the same way, let your light shine before others in Goa, in India, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. That's the vision Jesus is calling disciples. You follow me, I will make you light of the world. You will become a city set on a hill, giving light to the nations. And Re Revelation 21 is saying that John, who has in chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation, already looked at the sin in the church, rottenness in the church, failure in the church. Three of the churches have serious problems with sexual immorality. <coughs> Two are condemned, one is commended for not tolerating it. But it's a rampant problem. So he's seen the church in all of its weakness, but what you see is not the end. Jesus is introducing himself in, the, in Revelation 21 verse 5, that I am making all things new. So uh, Revelation 21 5, he says, and he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I'm making all things new. Also he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So he's out to make a new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem. He's taking these weak sinful churches, transforming them into the light of the world. That's revival. That's reformation. That's renewal. And that's the purpose of these meetings three evenings that we will be renewed, church and Goa will be renewed to become the light, <coughs> excuse me, light of the nations, light of the world. Um, this, uh, with all the horrible things that you read happening in the book of Revelation, the climax is glorious, but it raises very simple theological problems. In the new heavens and the new earth, why are there nations walking in darkness? Satan is in hell, uh, beast is the empire is in hell, the city, the prostitute, Babylon, is destroyed, <coughs> thrown into the ocean. Uh, the false prophet, the second beast, is in hell, all the sinners in hell. Why are there sick nations in, uh, in this new heaven and the new earth that need healing? Leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. So these are the sort of things we've been discussing and debating. I have a friend, a pastor in uh, California. He believes that the new Jerusalem will come like a gigantic UFO. Unidentified flying object, a huge flying saucer. But if it sits on the earth, its light can't reach the whole earth. 
the earth as well. So it will hover over the earth. Makes sense. Then it's light, like moon's light, the sun's light, can reach to all the nations. But then that is a problem. If there is this tree of life and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations, then the sick nations are here on the earth. And New Jerusalem will have to have a New Jerusalem pharmaceutical company <laughs> that takes the leaves, turns them uh, into, say, capsules, and uh, uh, brings them in uh, smaller flying saucers uh, to the earth to get to the sick nations. But then how do the nations take the capsules, perhaps? Um, the kings of the nations, but if they are prime ministers and presidents, uh, they take the capsules. Uh, that, that's a joke. But you see the difficulties of uh, understanding. One way to understand is that the book of Revelation is not linear. It's not chronological. A lot of Christians try to find a chronology, a timetable, that this happens after that, after that, after that, and this is the climax. But if you have a linear uh, mindset with which you are looking in the scriptures, in the book of Revelation, to make a calendar of what will happen in the end time, then you are in a problem that when all the sinners are in hell, why are there sick nations in New Heaven and the New Earth that need leaves for the tree of the healing? Uh, but if this is in fact a description of his bride, New Jerusalem, which has leaves, uh, which has the tree of life, and then which is in this world, then it makes sense that these are not chronological, chronologically arranged. Uh, this he has a style of writing which um, is different. So what we have said in our discussions is that for historic reasons, intellectual history, Western mind has become linear. Things, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, A to Z, Alpha, Omega, is a linear mindset. Indian, traditional Indian mindset is cyclical. That the universe begin, begins with golden age, uh, Satyu degenerates, the Treta, Dwapar, Kali Yuga is destroyed, mm -hmm. reborn as Satyu, golden age, um, silver, bronze, iron. Uh, we have a cyclical mindset. Now, both a line and a circle are two dimensional, <coughs> but this is multi dimensional. So, uh, geometry is not the best way of understanding the book of Revelation. But if you have to have a geometric uh, uh, terminology, vocabulary to understand Revelation, spiral makes the most sense. That you have seven seals after the seven churches. You have seven seals covering a, a scroll. And as they are opened, cataclysmic things are happening in the cosmos. You come to the end and you think that the climax is coming and is coming, but the seven trumpets begin with the seven, um, seventh seal when it's open. So then again, heaven and earth are being shaken as these trumpets are being blown. And you think that the end has come, but the seven trumpets begin. But John is told to don't write what the seven, uh, the seven thunders, seven trumpets and then seven thunders, what they have said. But at the end of the seven trumpets, you have the seven bowls of God's wrath, seven last plagues. Uh, but then you think that the end has come, and in fact that the terminology does uh, represent climax uh, of the revelation. But the angel says, now come, I'll show you uh, the new Jerusalem. You measure it, and I will show you the beast, and the second beast, and I will show you the lamb and uh, I will show you the prostitute, and I will show you the bride. And then when everything has ended, now he's looking at the bride uh, again uh, after the Last Supper, Final Judgment, etc. So this is a spiral. It is moving forward. You can think of it like this. But he's looking at the same reality from many different angles. So we've seen this 
let's revisit it, look, have a close up, let's revisit it, look at some of the things that we didn't actually notice last time. Uh, that's how the book is structured as a spiral going to the end, not as a linear. So you can't actually uh, build a timetable, or you can think of it, this is revelation of Jesus Christ, it's a diamond. So he is seeing here and then he says, now I'll show you this and I'll show you that and I'll show you this and let's look again here and notice some of the things that we hadn't seen. So it's a multifaceted diamond which is being shown in greater and greater detail and more of its beauty and meaning and everything else that's going on. So that's one fundamental way uh, of uh, looking that instead of imposing our mindset, whether linear or cyclical upon the text, we allow the text to change our mindset, our worldview. And we're not just getting information, but how to interpret that information, how to read and understand that interpret in, uh, information is being shaped by the author's mindset. <coughs> and then, um, as I've already hinted, that we don't necessarily look at different commentaries that are shaped by different mindset, but we uh, soak ourselves in the epistles. It looks to me that in Patmos, that John definitely has the book of Isaiah and possibly many other books. And he has the time and the leisure to read, to read it, to memorize, to really begin to understand the images and visions that different prophets have had. And uh, he's distilling all of that information. Now, is the Holy Spirit inspiring him, uh, angels showing him, or is his mind also active? So we looked at an imagery that I have an x-ray and one of my grandchild look, looks at my x-ray, my littlest one is two years, and uh, he looks at the x-ray. And uh, I look at my x-ray and I can write a good essay about it, how this x-ray happened. But a surgeon here, orthopedic surgeon, looks at the same x-ray, he interprets it. Now all three of us are looking at the same thing. Are we seeing the same thing?